In John 8, Jesus said something really interesting. He says, if you're my disciples, you will come to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, while there are a lot of layers to talk about when it comes to that phrase and what it means practically in our lives as believers, um, in today's video, I'm going to take this truth and I'm going to apply it to our struggle against depression. And when you do that, here's what you see Jesus is saying. What he's saying is that the lies and the deceptions and the distorted ways that you view reality because of your depression are holding you in bondage. And the only way to be set free from that bondage is to learn truth. Not just to understand truth, but to believe it. And that belief actually has power and capacities to set you free from your depression. Not setting you free in the sense that you're not going to feel depressed anymore. Because remember, I've, I've told you guys in my videos that I still experience depression. But instead, even though you're going to be able to experience depression, it's not going to control you and oppress you anymore. Instead, you're going to have the ability to fight your depression and even find positivity that comes from your depression. Now, that might sound really weird because if you're experiencing depression, you're like, what can possibly be positive about this depression? It's debilitating. It's horrible. I hate it. Well, it might surprise you when I say this, but your depression actually does something good, and this is what it does. It enables you to be able to think through and to experience sadness, loss, and grief in an unflinching manner that enables you to deal with these things and to have compassion and empathy on others who are also going through these things. Now, this is how that happens. For most people, when they experience things like loss or grief or thoughts come into their mind of the possibility of death or sadness or things like that, what they have the ability to do is they have the ability to just disassociate from those things. They can just distract themselves and not think about them. However, people who are depressed don't have that ability. When those thoughts come into their mind, they stay, they linger, they bring us down. We can't just get rid of them. They stay with us and they haunt us. And because of that, we have to think about them. Now that's the bad thing about depression, but it's also the good thing. What that's doing for you, whether you know it or not, is it's actually preparing you to deal more practically and more healthily when loss and sadness actually come into your life. And it also enables you to be able to share compassion and empathy on people going through something similar. So think about it this way. If I've conditioned myself my entire life that every time a negative emotion comes in my life, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to think about that, right, death, it can't happen to me, loss, it's not going to happen to me, what it's going to do is either going to, A, make you a far more cynical person, in which case you're going to be telling yourself, well, I'm, I'm just not sad about that, I'm not going to think about that, and you're going to succeed. You're not going to think about things, and you're not going to be sad about things. But it's also going to mean that you're not going to care about things, which is really, really negative, and it's something that has happened to me in the past. But also, what it could do to you is that when actual loss comes in your life, when actual sadness comes in your life, when the possibility of death really does loom large in your mind, what's going to happen is those thoughts and those emotions are going to destroy you. You have no capacity to deal with them because you haven't prepared for them, and therefore they're going to flatten you. Beyond that, when someone else comes into your life that's dealing with sadness or grief, your only possible way of showing compassion or empathy on that person is going to, is going to be to try to get them not to think about it. And be like, well, you know, let's not think about this. Let's not talk about this. That's sad. That's depressing, right? Let's, let's change the topic. Let's, let's do something different. So in other words, you're, you're going to be kind of mean and dismissive of people's emotions. And it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Inside Out. And in Inside Out, which is, by the way, a movie all about depression, uh, the emotions of a girl are personified in these characters of, you know, sadness, joy, disgust, fear, and anger. And the main character is Joy, and throughout the movie she just cannot understand why sadness exists, and she hates her as a result. And at one point in the movie, one of the characters ends up encountering a great amount of loss. They lose something that means quite a bit to them. And Joy's response to it is to go up to him and start making funny faces at him and to try to make him laugh. This only makes him more depressed, because remember, he can't feel happy at this moment because he's too sad. So because of that, when Joy does that, he feels like there's a disconnect between the two of them, and it just makes him even more depressed. But then sadness comes in, and she sits down next to him, and she says, man, that's really sad that you lost that. You really cared about it, and now it's gone. And they begin to cry together, and that weeping and that mourning and that grieving that they do together makes him feel unalone, and it actually gives him the resource to be able to process his loss and to move forward. Right? Did you know that there's a reason why you cry? Right? Some of us hate crying, and so we try to stop it from ever happening. But when you cry, did you know that your brain slows down and actually gains the ability to be able to process sadness? 
if you stop yourself from crying, if you're like, no, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to grieve or mourn or in any capacity whatsoever, then that sadness is actually going to stay with you. It's going to haunt you. You're not going to be able to deal with it, and therefore you're never going to be able to move forward. Right? When we weep, when we mourn, it actually does something beneficial. So people who are depressed have greater capacities to weep and mourn, and so therefore they can learn from their loss and grow from it, but they're also able to teach others the same thing and weep with those who weep. It's an amazing capacity that depressed people have. So unfortunately, when you go through most modern day psycho psychological books, whether they be theistic or atheistic, one of the main solutions that they give depressed people is just, well, yeah, you know, these really morbid thoughts that you have, they're, they're really bad and they might have some truth in them, but it's just more beneficial just not to think about them. In other words, they're trying to teach depressed people how to do something that their depression actually is making them do and therefore has positive repercussions. They're stripping you, they're stripping the dep depressed person of the one positive aspect of their depression, which is incredibly negative. What we need to learn how to do instead is we need to learn how to hold on to the positive aspects of depression while also denying the negatives. And here's the negative. Because depressed people can see life with an unflinching eye and because they can't disassociate from emotion, what that does to them is it makes them believe that their thought process and their emotional process is correct where everyone else's is wrong. So when you're sad and depressed and you're like, man, no one loves me, nobody cares about me, and people come alongside you and they're like, man, I care about you, I love you, and I'm going to be there for you. Instead of thinking like, hey, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe my emotional state is wrong. Maybe this person is correct. Instead, what you're going to think is they're blind. They don't see things the way that I do. That's not true, right? I know the truth. I am unloved. I am uncared for, right? In other words, it's completely robbed you of the ability to even question your emotional state because your emotional state has become so central to the way that you think, right? And in our culture and society, by the way, this is an even greater occupational hazard because we say things like, well, that's just my truth. Meaning that people in our culture and society today don't even think about challenging their emotional state. They just see their emotional state as being true for them and therefore it's their truth. But here's the thing, when Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, once again, he's insinuating that you lie to yourself. You deceive yourself. The ways that you see things may not be true. You may be wrong. This was a terrifying notion for me to be able to accept. I always thought that, yeah, people will lie to me, but I don't lie to me. I could trust myself. This truth showed me, no, I can't. Maybe some of the ways that I think are wrong. Maybe my emotions are incorrect, and therefore they need to be fought. And that's exactly what you see happening in Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, when he says that phrase, Why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? He's challenging his emotional state, isn't he? He's asking the question, why am I so depressed? Right? Is there a good reason to be depressed right now? Should I be depressed? And his solution, his answer is no. That's why he says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Right? When you look through Psalm 42 and you're like, well, he gives a lot of reasons to be depressed in Psalm 42. No, he doesn't. Right? What he's saying is that he's already depressed at the beginning of the psalm, and therefore he's doing things that are making him feel more depressed, like isolating himself and not eating and taking care of his body. But that's not the cause of his depression. They're reactions from his depression. Right? So what the psalmist figures out is he figures out there's no good reason for me to be depressed, so therefore I need to fight the emotion. Now that doesn't always happen in the Bible, by the way. In Psalm 51, David, when he's going through grief and mourning for wrong actions he's committed, he actually says the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. These he will not deny. In other words, what he's saying is there's good reason for me to be depressed right now. There's reason for me to have a broken spirit, and I shouldn't deny that. I should embrace that. I should grieve, and I should mourn because of the wrong actions that I've committed. There are times to be in grief. There are times to be depressed where those emotions are correct, and it's good to feed them, and it's good to dwell in them. Because those emotions, when you, when you dwell in them and when you accept them, they give you the, the capacity to process the grief and to move forward as a result. However, there are certain times where your depression is wrong, where it's not giving you reality, it's distorting reality. And the only way to be able to combat it is to be able to accept the fact that your depression might be lying to you. So how do you know the truth and separate it from the lies? Well, what I had to do, 
and what I accepted from what Jesus was saying is that his words are truth. So therefore, what I did is I said, I need to submit myself under the scriptures and accept them as being true more than my emotions. So when I started thinking things like, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, I began to question that. I would say, wait, wait, is that true? So I did, the, I did the question, right? I said, why am I depressed right now? Why am I downcast on my soul, right? And my solution was, I feel unloved. I feel uncared for. But then I questioned that. And I said, whoa, wait, is that true though? Am I really unloved? Am I really uncared for? And I would go through the Bible and say, are there reasons to believe that God doesn't love me? And I couldn't find any. But you know what I found? I found a lot of reasons to believe that God does care about me. And one of my favorite verses for combating this thought whenever it comes up in my life is Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writing to people who, by the way, are going through suffering and loss, he says, what shall we say to these things? What things? The loss, the suffering that you're experiencing. If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his only son, but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him freely give us all things? So when I listened to that, I thought, Paul's argument is, what is the most difficult thing in the universe for God to do? Is it to create? No, with a word he could create. Is it to perform miracles? No, with a simple thought he could change the very fabric of reality. What is the hardest thing in the universe for God to do? It would be giving up his only begotten son, whom he loves more than the stars and the planets and the universe as a whole. That would be the hardest possible thing for God to do, to take his son and to allow him to be beaten and tortured and mocked and spat upon and crucified in a most shameful way that you can imagine. That would be the hardest thing in the universe for God to do, yet he did it. Why? For you and for me. So when I accepted that as being true and I said, you know what? I have good reason to believe that God cares for me and that he loves me. Why? Because he didn't spare his son for me. He gave everything to be in a relationship with me. I know that God loves me. No matter what I feel right now, that is truth. And then I began to move that thought even further. I'd be like, is there reason to believe that other people love me and care about me? And of course, in my distorted, depressed mindset, I'd be like, no, you know, people don't really understand me. They don't really care about me. They're not doing enough for me, right? They're not actually accepting of me. And I began to challenge that too. I'd be like, well, wait, wait, wait. if people really didn't accept me, why are they still in my life, right? Why are they trying to hang out with me? Why are they trying to reach out to me in these moments? Right? I would really begin to question my emotions and I would say, are these emotions right? And over and over and over again, I would come to the conclusion, no, they're not. And what this did is it did exactly for me what it did to the psalmist. It filled me with hope. The enemy of depression is hope. Because if you're expecting to just not feel depressed, that's probably not going to happen. However, hope becomes, as Hebrews 6 says, an anchor for your soul, both sure and steadfast, that pierces through to the other side of the veil. This is what he's saying, that hope is an anchor. It grounds you against the waves of emotion that are going to rock you back and forth, that are going to move you so powerfully. But that hope remains firm if it's in a firm foundation. And the Bible, the Word of God, is the firmest foundation that you're ever going to find. So as I challenged my emotions and my beliefs, I found that the hope, the longings for these greater realities and these greater truths enabled me to combat my emotions and combat my depression so that it didn't oppress me, it didn't take over me, it didn't control me anymore, but I was able to resist and I was able to stand firm in the midst of it. So in my next video, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to mend the spirit, how to grow as a result of your depression. However, I hope that this has been a helpful thing for you. And just remember that the truth is what is going to be what's going to set you free. And the truth is found primarily in the Word of God. So I'll talk to you guys next week, and I hope you have a good one.